True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. On the remote island of Palmyra, about 970 nautical miles south of Hawaii, a series of crimes occurred against an experienced sailing couple, Mac and Muff Graham. A handful of other sailors spent time with the Grahams on the island, but the Grahams were eventually left alone with a desperate young couple, Stephanie Stearns and her fugitive boyfriend, Leslie Buck Walker. Then the Grahams went missing. Soon afterward, their boat was seen at a busy marina, repainted and in the possession of Stearns and Walker. The logical conclusion was that they had stolen the Grahams' boat and murdered the couple, but finding evidence in bringing Stearns and Walker to trial would take years. Join us at the quiet end for Seaworthy, Murder on Palmyra. Learning what it takes to sail the ocean on a small sailboat and survive on a deserted island has really been fascinating. At the core of the case is the seaworthiness of Stearns and Walker's boat. The couple sailed to the island on a rickety boat with inadequate food and supplies, and this leads to the very valid question of whether their plan from the beginning was to steal a seaworthy, well-stocked boat and murder its crew. So listen, Jill. Try as I might, I couldn't find any breweries on Palmyra. <laughs> well, no, there wouldn't be, would there? It's and they're, they're deserted. Basically out in the middle of nowhere. Yes. So I was thinking, okay, what can I do for a substitute? And there's coconuts on this island. They ate a lot of coconut flesh and drank coconut water. But the one beer I've had that's brewed with coconut, I've already done a review on for true crime brewery. So there goes that. Then I came up with what to me seemed a very novel idea. And I was thinking back to mythology with the sirens luring unwary sailors to their death. So that's what I decided to do. And I picked a beer called Siren Song, brewed by Lacumbre Brewing Company, which just happens to be here in New Mexico, up in Albuquerque. One of our favorites. Very much so. So that's a long-winded explanation as to why I'm doing a New Mexican beer for this case. It is, yes. <laughs> now, Siren Song is an imperial red ale that's been barrel-aged. It's 11% alcohol by volume. So we'll just be sipping this and sharing. It's mahogany color, little, little small beige head, some lacing. Very great aroma and taste. I get some caramel, cherry, vanilla, boozy aroma. Translates to bourbon in the taste. It's quite bourbony. Caramel, cherry, and vanilla taste. This is a big, boozy beer. And the booze, the alcohol, doesn't detract from the beer in any way. This is very much a world-class beer. All right, I can't wait to try it. Why don't we open it up? You have tried it somewhat before. You might not remember. I don't remember. It was probably years ago. It was. It was the non-barrel-aged red called La Rojo Grande. You had maybe too many of those? <laughs> well, I do have some fond memories of that day. You remember how affectionate you became? I became very affectionate and just friendly all around. You were. <laughs> so that's the story. Okay. So come on and join me down at the quiet end. I'm ready. And it's still pretty quiet at the quiet end, isn't it? Remarkably so. I mean, the only noise really is the puppy chewing on his toy. Yes. We'll try and keep that out of the mix as much as we can. Yeah, but if you hear a little chompy noise every once in a while, it's just the new puppy. Yeah, we didn't have the heart to lock him up. Okay, let's, let's talk about this case. This is a very interesting case, as you said. So when the 40-something-year-old couple, Mac and Muff Graham, left for the island of Palmyra. They were just beginning their planned ocean voyage. Their sailboat, called the Sea Wind, was a 38-foot, two-masted catch. Mac maintained the boat perfectly, and the couple stocked it for any foreseeable emergency. So this is a very well-prepared crew. 
Yeah, the Sea Wind had been completely remodeled, actually, with just the finest materials, and took about two years for Mac to complete. It had a shortwave radio and an automatic pilot system. The galley was impeccably decorated with a battery-powered refrigerator and freezer, which is almost unheard of. It was an impressive vessel which was envied by most others. And it was this envy which I believe led to Mac and Muff's murders. So first, let's start with a little background on the Grams. Okay. Mac Graham loved the sea. Uh, he was a hands-on sailor from an early age. He felt like he'd been born for the sea since his father took him sailing off the coast of New England. He moved from Michigan to the West Coast, got work in marinas on the California coast. He was skilled with machinery, and he was trained in engineering at General Motors. And all, all these skills helped him remodel and maintain the sea wind independently, so he took care of things himself. And he also loved adventure. He was determined to become a blue water sailor, meaning that he was sailing on the open deep waters of the sea without any land being visible. When he was 28 years old, an uncle left him $100,000 in stocks and bonds. Now, this inheritance allowed him to purchase his own sailboat for $20,000, and the remainder of his inheritance he kept in conservative investments. The investments, along with working odd jobs, allowed Mac the freedom to modify his boat and sail the world. Yeah, so in 1961, Mac married Eleanor Laverne Eddington, a.k.a. Muff, in La Paz, Mexico. At the time of her marriage to Mac, she was 29 and Mac was 30. Then in 1974, they sailed off for a 1,000-mile trip to a deserted island. At age 43, the age he was when he was murdered, Mac was an experienced blue-water sailor, and his voyage to Palmyra wasn't really that much of a challenge for him. Muff's contribution to preparing for this trip was to stock the sea wind with two years' worth of food. But she was definitely a reluctant sailor, as she accompanied Mac on the open sea. But she did try and be a good sport about it. It was her planning in the galley that really gave them the comforts of home and gained her the admiration of other sailors when they docked in faraway ports. On her own, she wasn't much of an adventurer. She was happy to limit her sailing to the waters right off the Southern California coast. So when Mac told her of his plans to sail to Palmyra, a small deserted island well south of Hawaii, and stay there for up to a year, she wasn't thrilled, and she was, appropriately, concerned for their safety. Yeah, previously she had felt uncomfortable with their sailing trips, but her concerns about Palmyra seemed to be more intense and more extreme even to the point of feeling their impending deaths. She was really uptight about this. Holy cow. She had a bad feeling. In fact, she was so nervous that she got a prescription for anxiety medication from her doctor. She also consulted a spiritualist who told her something terrible will happen. Well, that's great to hear, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you already got the heebie-jeebies about taking this cruise, and you got a spiritualist who's saying, oh, bad things are going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And then Muff's concerns would only get worse when she spent some time with Stephanie and Buck. Yeah, Stephanie grew up in New York City until she was 10 and her parents divorced. Then she moved with her mother to Los Angeles. She dropped out of high school, but she did go back to get her GED. And after going to junior college for two years, she moved to Hawaii to help her uncle as a waitress in his small restaurant. So prior to the theft of the Sea Wind and the murders of Mac and Muff Graham, Stephanie did have a criminal history. She had two petty theft convictions, a marijuana possession conviction, and an arrest for the possession and sale of MDA. MDA is a synthetic psychoactive drug. It has a chemical structure similar to methamphetamine, but it causes hallucinations. Yeah, not a great drug. Yeah, it can be a real party drug as well. Yeah. Now, in 1972, while she was working for her uncle, Stephanie met Buck Walker. He had a five-page criminal record and was on the run when she met him. He had served time in San Quentin for armed robbery, and he'd also spent time in a mental hospital for the criminally insane. His criminal career began when he was still a teenager in Oregon. In 1973... Two police undercover officers arrested Buck in a department store parking lot 
after he sold them a large amount of amphetamines. He pleaded guilty. Then while free on bail, he took on a new identity. He became Roy Allen, and he and Stephanie moved to Maui, where she worked in a bar while he hastily rebuilt the decrepit old sailboat. Yes, yeah, so Buck Walker didn't show up for his sentencing. Yeah, it doesn't sound like he had any intention of doing that. No. On July 1st, 1974, he and Stephanie sailed to Palmyra, along with three dogs and very little for provisions. And this was in a boat named Iola. He had a fantasy of growing cannabis there and selling it, and he had spoken to some people about doing that. So the estimated land mass of Palmyra is approximately 200 acres, with the highest elevation at just over six feet. During its occupation by the Navy, numerous concrete structures were built, along with an airstrip. The West Lagoon is approximately 140 feet deep, and entry to the lagoon is made by crossing a channel 700 yards in length. Palmyra has a very large bird population, and there are thousands of coconut trees which can grow up to 90 feet high. The lagoon and reefs are full of fish, but many of them are poisonous and it's also full of aggressive black-tipped sharks. The island also has a large population of edible land crabs and coconut crabs, but it also has feral rats roaming around. Palmyra wasn't inhabited by any permanent residents since World War II, so it's just some adventurous sailors who would stop by there occasionally. So why were they planning on spending a year there? Mac was really into adventure, and he wanted to stay there and explore the island. I guess there was a lot to explore. Why? It doesn't sound like it's really that exciting. Well, I can really see how Muff felt about this. I wouldn't be thrilled. Oh, me too. I wouldn't want to do it. But maybe maybe they didn't know all that before they left. I don't know. It just doesn't sound like a real fun year. So sailing south to Palmyra from Hawaii was an easy voyage for the Grams. They had smooth seas and favorable winds. Sailing back would be the more difficult. Prudent sailors would not attempt that trip without a seaworthy vessel. So the Iola, according to everyone who saw the boat and knew something about boats, was not seaworthy. So they might get to Palmyra from Hawaii, but they weren't going to get back. Yeah, and they barely made it. This was a small wooden sailboat, and the Iola had been submerged for months at one point. After it was brought up and dried out, Stephanie and Buck Walker purchased it for 400 bucks. And at the time of the purchase, the Iola didn't have a motor, a mast, rigging, a radio, winches, sails, or even a toilet. So Walker built a heavy 40-foot mast from some 2x6 wooden planks. He made his rigging from rusted telephone pole cables. And knowing little about how to apply resin and fiberglass to a wooden hull, he didn't do a proper job of that. So consequently, the hull of the Iola had multiple cracks, which leaked badly. So can you imagine going out on the ocean in that? Not me. Not me either. So her sailing days should have really been well behind her. Making it to Palmyra on the Iola was dangerous, kind of crazy. But getting back to Hawaii would be totally impossible. In fact, the Iola was severely leaking as Stephanie and Buck sailed to Palmyra. The bilge pump had to run every day just to keep them afloat. And now back to the Grams as they were preparing to depart for Palmyra. Muff was feeling increasingly apprehensive. She had insomnia, heart palpitations, and stomach problems, all stress-related. She didn't look forward to being at sea. They had already cruised the world, and she had memories of constant fear and bad weather and dangerous seas. On a six-year round-the-world cruise that they had taken nearly a decade earlier, they had survived a typhoon in the South Pacific and a close call with pirates in the Mediterranean. So that's just terrifying to me, and I can't imagine wanting to go out and do that again. No, I couldn't. I mean, the pirate thing is terrifying. And they had had a boat coming after them with pirates, to the point where Mac had held up a gun and the boat turned around. But it could have just as easily gone the other way and they could have been murdered. Right. So at sunrise on June 1, 1974, the Iola left from Port Allen on the southern shore of Kauai. Stephanie and Walker began the trip feeling exhilarated. 
but after a few hours the wind fell and they just bobbed in the waves without making any headway. They could have started their outboard engine, which Walker had attached to the stern, but they really had to conserve the little bit of fuel that they had. Not only did they have two little supplies for themselves, but they'd also brought three dogs along, which is very inconvenient and I'd even have to say cruel to the dogs. Stephanie had a tiny mutt named Puffer, and Buck brought his female lab mix and a male pit bull mix. The pit bull wasn't neutered and could be quite aggressive. They brought 150 pounds of dog food on board, but this wasn't enough to last very long on the island. Also, to keep the dogs from falling overboard, Walker had secured 80 feet of netting to the lifelines from the bow to the stern. The boat moved slowly toward their destination, and Walker was very seasick. They had no radar, no piloting system, so Stephanie remained at the helm. Walker had fantasized about sailing around the world, but the reality was not living up to his imagination at all. He actually became very depressed and difficult to be with. But it seemed like Stephanie loved this guy, and she tried to meet all of his emotional and physical needs. His father had recently died in a construction accident, and Walker had idolized the man. He described his father as handsome, intelligent, logical, and charming. But to Stephanie, he sounded like a kind of a wanderer and a loser, although she kept that to herself. Probably a good idea. So it's really just a wonder that they even made it to Palmyra. Oh, um, it sounds like they were just dumb luck that got them there. Well, and they went off course several times. It was just a mess. Stephanie had spent over $1,000 to stockpile for the trip. She brought rice, soybeans, flour, and sugar in large amounts that she was able to buy at discount prices. They brought along 30 gallons of fresh water and also some canned goods. So every storage space in the Iola was filled with these provisions. Now their galley was nothing like the Graham's galley. It had a two-burner stove, a coffee pot, and a tiny metal sink. So the quarters were very tight, but Stephanie did try and make it homey. She sewed some curtains to cover the portholes in the open storage bins. But it was just kind of a losing battle. Yeah, before they left for Palmyra, Walker had worked out a business deal with two brothers. Walker would grow a large crop of marijuana on Palmyra, and the brothers would smuggle it into Hawaii and sell it at a profit. Part of the deal was that the brothers would bring supplies with them in late August. So... That's all kind of uncertain. It could have been that these friends were just a cover-up and that Walker was planning all along to murder someone and steal their boat. But this is the story that he and Stephanie told. He did bring a twenty two caliber gun on board, and Stephanie didn't like guns, but he had explained to her that they needed it for protection from pirates. So she agreed to learn how to shoot it, and she went ahead and did that. The Iola leaked more as the movement of the ocean worked her wooden planks back and forth and actually cracked the fiberglass. So the forward hatch let water in even when it was shut tight, and to remain afloat they had to start the generator and run the pump every day. I would be terrified in this situation. <laughs> you know, you're out in the middle of the ocean with no land visible, and your ship is sinking. Yeah, it's terrifying, isn't it? Oh, God. And they're lucky that didn't happen. After a week at sea, they really had no idea where they were either. They just kept heading where the compass was pointing due south, so they went off course more than once. And even before they reached Palmyra, their food supply was getting low. On June 19th, Stephanie and Buck were surprised and relieved when they saw Palmyra. And as they approached, they realized that entering the lagoon wasn't going to be easy. They hadn't brought their motor inside, and the salt water and humidity had seized it up. So... They really didn't know what they were doing. They would have to sail through the narrow channel between some very treacherous reefs. So they actually waited on the Iola until June 27th, when there was a wind blowing southeast. And as they tried to sail down the middle of the channel, the wind died down on them and they drifted backward and to the side. And the Iola got caught on a coral reef. Walker dove in to check the bottom of their boat, and there was no damage to the hull. It was the solid iron part of the Iola's keel that was stuck on the reef. 
but when he was in the water, he was confronted quickly by a six-foot black-tipped shark. <laughs> now, luckily for them, Walker made it back onto the boat, and then two motorized dinghies came toward them out of the channel. So people were coming to the rescue for them. Yeah, well, that's, I guess that's part of the traveling. You help out your friends or your neighbors. Well, sure, but I don't think that Walker really helped anyone. No. The dinghies held two men and a teenage boy, and they tossed lines to Walker, and he tied them to the Iola's bow. Within minutes, the boat was freed, and the dinghies towed them into the lagoon. And this island was lush with thousands of coconut trees behind this beautiful strip of white sandy beach. Before they paddled to the land, Walker reminded Stephanie that his name now was Roy Allen to anyone who asked. Before they departed on June 1st, Walker had convinced a friend named Gina Allen to give him her husband's ID and birth certificate. Her husband had a severe head injury and was living in a veteran's home. So Walker had used this ID to get a passport as Roy Allen. The one thing is, though, that Walker had Buck tattooed on one of his arms. But he didn't seem concerned about explaining that to strangers, and really he just refused to explain it. Now, meanwhile, the sea wind was sailing between San Diego and Hawaii. Now, the seas were so rough that Mac and Muff couldn't see anything but the waves. Well, that sounds like a fun trip, but <laughs> still, Mac was pleased with how the trip was going. <laughs> they had no equipment failures, and they were making good time. Mac was wishing that Muff could share his excitement, but that wasn't going to happen. No, she was nervous, like most of us would be. On May 25, 1974, Mac and Muff arrived on Hawaii's Big Island. They had sailed over 2,000 miles in 18 days. Pretty good. They moored the sea wind next to a sailboat owned by Curtis Shoemaker. Now, Shoemaker had been sailing for over 30 years. He was now working as a telephone repairman, and he was an experienced ham radio operator. But Mac and Muff got along very well with Shoemaker and his wife, Momi. They visited several times on each other's boats. Shoemaker was impressed with Mac's two-way radio setup, and he suggested that they establish a radio communications link while Mac and Muff were on Palmyra. Shoemaker warned Mac that they could run into some trouble out there alone, and he thought it would be a good idea to keep in regular contact with someone in the outside world. Well, I mean, and that seems like an obvious thing. But it seems that Mac was just a little bit arrogant and didn't like to accept help too easily. Shoemaker did have this high-powered radio at his mountain home, so the two men set up a weekly schedule to check in. Mac wasn't the type of guy who would like to admit he might need help someday, but he and Muff did like the idea that they could convey messages to family and friends through Shoemaker. And of course, Muff, the one with the common sense, felt pretty good that they at least had someone who would know if something went wrong, someone who they could check in with. Well, I would have thought they would have done that anyway. <laughs> they're, they're sailing uncharted water. Well, not uncharted, but, you know, a long stretch of ocean. It's a good idea to have someone to check in with. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, Mac was kind of stubborn and independent. Yeah, he doesn't need any help. Right, exactly. So Mac and Muff seemed to be as well-prepared as they could be for their voyage. They even had a big supply of medicine on board, along with medical instructions and correct dosages. A former Sea Wind crew member was a medical doctor, and he had left his black bag behind when he left the boat in Mexico. Mac had brought weapons with him as well. He had a rifle, and he had a powerful handgun. He kept these in a little cabinet beside his bunk. So on June 24, 1974, they left at sunrise for Palmyra. So even though Stephanie and Walker had received help to get to the lagoon, they were disappointed not to have Palmyra to themselves, which makes no sense because if they were by themselves, they wouldn't have gotten the help. Right, and they wouldn't have anybody to steal a boat from. That's true, too. So they moored the Iola between two other boats at a line of steel and wooden posts that they call mooring dolphins. They were only 15 yards from shore, and they loaded themselves and their three dogs onto their dinghy and rowed to the beach. So they just seemed to have no clue what they're doing. One of the boats was the Poseidon, a 
eight-foot catch owned by a man named Jack Wheeler. He and his teen son, Steve, had been in one of the dinghies that towed the Iola to the lagoon. Wheeler's wife, Lee, and his daughter, Sharon, were also there with them. The other boat was the Caroline. It was a 40-foot boat with twin engines, and that was captained by a man named Larry Briggs. Wheeler was super friendly. He took Stephanie and Roy, a.k.a. Buck, on a tour of the island. And as they walked, he explained that they were on Cooper Island, that was the biggest islet of Palmyra, and he warned them about which fish were poisonous in the lagoon and told them which fish were safe to eat. But you know, the lagoon was full of black-tipped sharks, and these are some of the most aggressive sharks in the Pacific. They grew up to six feet long, so they could be a threat for sure. And this killed the couple's fantasy of swimming in the lagoon together. A crewman from the Caroline invited Stephanie and Walker on board for a drink, and they drank rum mixed with coconut milk, which sounds delicious. They also smoked a joint with one of the younger crewmen. Jack Wheeler brought them some fish for dinner that night. Their friendship with Wheeler suffered, though, the next day when Walker's pit bull bit his son, Steve. So, of course, the Wheelers were really upset, and Walker agreed to chain up the dog, but that didn't last. And Walker never really seemed sorry about it at all. He was just kind of an asshole from the beginning. And on June 30th, the Caroline departed Palmyra, and that left seven people there. The next day, Stephanie saw a two-masted sailboat that was anchored outside of the channel. And on July 2nd, two boats entered the lagoon. The first was the sea wind. Walker rode out to greet the new people. He offered to help Mac get the boat to the moorings beside the Iola. But Max said he wanted a little more privacy than that. Right, and remember, he kind of knows everything and doesn't want anyone to... Yeah, he doesn't... He doesn't need help. Doesn't need anything from anybody. But an hour later, Mac and Muff did come walking through a jungle path toward the Iola, and they were all friendly and introduced themselves. Mac talked about their trip from Hawaii like it was really a breeze. It had only taken them a week to get there. Mac was a smoker, and he offered a cigarette to Walker, who was kind of drooling looking at them. But when Mac held out his pack, Walker took two cigarettes. He had given up smoking when he ran out of tobacco, which was soon after they had left Hawaii, but he'd been desperate to start up again, and he was happy to take those cigarettes. But it just seemed rude. It kind of gives you an indication of his personality. Yeah. Someone offers you a cigarette, and you have the nerve to just pull two out. It's a dick move. It is. Yeah. Then a couple hours later, the Journeyer, a 45-foot cutter owned by Marilyn and Edwin Pollock, moored next to the Iola. So now there's four boats, and everyone seemed disappointed that they weren't alone. There was an unspoken resentment felt by Walker, Pollock, Wheeler, and Mac. Each felt like their territory had been intruded upon. Sure, but they did try and get along for the most part. Well, sure. Mac and Muff had anchored the sea wind into a small cove that gave them the privacy that Mac wanted. He tied the boat to two trees near the water and dropped his anchor off the bow. Then he sank a second anchor in the shallow reef. So he was making sure that a squall wouldn't run the sea wind aground. Two days later, Jack Wheeler took Mac and Muff's letters to their families back to Hawaii to mail for them. The Wheelers left for Hawaii on July 6th. Mac's letter to his mother described this island paradise, and he was so excited to explore this island. Of course, Muff's letter to her mother and sisters had a very different take on things. She described her hesitancy to go on the trip, an encounter with a powerful storm, and also the sharks and the poisonous fish in the lagoon. She also mentioned all of the creepy crawly wildlife including crabs, rats, mosquitoes, and spiders. She wrote that Mac was thrilled to be there, but she missed her family already. Yeah, and after all, despite her complaints, she was a pro at living on the, on the boat, the sea wind. She organized the galley. She tied the awnings to provide shade over the deck while Mac hooked up the large generator and worked on building a dock from lumber that he had found on the island. So he's very self-sufficient. Yeah. Just get off and build a dock? That's pretty crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's this wood lying around. I think I'll build a dock. Yeah, right. <sighs> now, Walker, old buck, he turned out to be one crappy fisherman. 
Stephanie tried to barter with the others for food. She made some coconut butter from the coconut she managed to scavenge off the ground. So she brought a container of coconut butter to the sea wind, and Mac gave her a couple of fish to eat for dinner that night. He was obviously better at catching fish, and he had the advantage of a motorized dinghy that allowed him to move through the lagoon. Yeah, but Mac did invite the younger couple on board one evening, and he showed off his boat to them. He was a nice guy, but like I said, he could be quite arrogant, and that could probably set off people like Buck Walker. It just didn't go over well with him. The sea wind was impressive, and likely made Stephanie and Walker very envious. Muff was more standoffish than Mac, but she greeted the couple, and she poured them some chilled white wine in long-stemmed glasses. Below deck, the sea wind had polished wooden accents with plushed carpet. There were even pieces of art collected on their travels. Mac showed Walker his built-in workshop on the boat, where he had a large collection of tools. He had a metal working lathe to make screws or metal plates, and a citalene torch to repair riggings as well. So he's very prepared for just about anything. He's ready. So at first the couples got along well enough. And even Muff seemed to warm up a little bit to the younger couple. Walker made them uncomfortable, but Stephanie was very friendly and more well-mannered, and she seemed to kind of make up for Walker's quiet periods. Mac told the couple that they planned to stay for about a year, but then he was disappointed to hear that Stephanie and Walker planned to stay on there indefinitely. Stephanie told Mac and Muff that they expected friends in late August to bring them more provisions. And before they left, Mac gave Buck a tin of tobacco and a package of rolling papers so he could roll his own cigarettes. So that seemed like a really nice gesture. And they parted on friendly terms that first evening. Jill, what are you burning out here? Bodies? (laughs) Well, no. I'm throwing in all of our earbuds and headphones with a little bit of lighter fluid as my protest against podcast ads in my favorite shows. I'm just getting into a story or I'm dozing off and it's interrupted with commercials. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. (laughs) Nice movie reference. Anyway, let's just simmer down here. You do know that our True Crime Brewery listeners have the option to subscribe to our premium show for ad-free episodes and bonus episodes, right? It costs as little as $4 per month, and these contributions help support the cost of producing TCB. Well, of course. I love and appreciate our subscribers. You know, I worked for weeks with our IT girl to set that up, and all because I have a deeply held belief that our listeners shouldn't have to hear ads. That's well said. Now, let me ask you this. How are we going to record this week's episode without our headphones? Oh, for fuck's sake. Well, you stay here. I'll go get the hose. Okay, hurry. And so Buck set up camp off of the Iola took his two dogs with him. He wanted Stephanie to move to the camp with him, but there was no way on earth she's going to do that. She wasn't going to sleep anywhere on or near the ground. There were too many crabs and rats crawling around. Buck found an old cot in one of the abandoned Navy buildings, and he had a Coleman stove and lantern. Stephanie stayed on the Iola with her dog Puffer. And she prepared the meals and they ate together. But their stores of food were running low. Well, they were running low, but they weren't going to starve. You could survive off the land, you know, but it would take some effort, and it seemed like Buck was quite lazy. Muff wrote to her mother on July 13th, giving the letter to Marilyn Pollock to mail for her. This was the first time that she shared her concerns about Stephanie and Buck, who she knew as Roy Allen. She wrote that the couple had run out of sugar, cigarettes, and dog food. Roy has a chainsaw, she wrote, and he was cutting down trees just to get the coconuts, and this made Mac furious. It would have been easy enough to climb up the tree and get the coconuts, and it was just a horrible thing to just kill a tree so you could steal some coconuts off of it. It's not sustainable. It's very destructive. 
Now more than that, though, Muff was really concerned about the two big dogs who were just roaming on the island and were hungry. She had already come very close to being attacked by the hungry pit bull more than once. And then it turned out that Palmyra wasn't the ideal place to grow marijuana either. Stephanie went out and gathered soil, and they ended up creating a garden on the roof of an abandoned building. This kept their plants out of reach of the crabs and rats and other creatures that walked on the ground. Walker had built a ladder and rigged up a bucket on a rope to haul up the soil that they found, and they hoped to grow their own vegetables in addition to the marijuana. But still, this wasn't going to fix their immediate problems. This would take a few weeks. They needed close to 100 wheelbarrow loads of soil for this garden, which would take several hours a day for more than a week for them to accomplish. So it was no easy task. I don't imagine it was. They were also beginning to worry that Buck's friends might not show up with supplies in August. If that happened, they could find provisions on Washington Island, which is about 120 miles away. But Washington was a reef island, meaning there is no channel to get ashore. The nearest island where food could be purchased was Fanning, which was 175 miles away. Fanning had a few hundred residents and a general store. Jack Wheeler had shared this information, but he had also told them that the voyage would be too difficult for a boat with no motor because they would have to go against the wind. Well, difficult. It would be impossible. It would be a tough go. So it was suggested that they go to American Samoa because there would be favorable, favorable winds the whole way. But American Samoa is like a thousand miles away, so that's probably not feasible either. So it seems like none of these options were really going to work for the couple. How could it? You can't go against the wind, and going a thousand miles with really hardly any provisions yeah. and that leaky uh, boat? I mean, you're screwed. Yeah. So Mac and Muff spoke with Kurt Shoemaker and his wife on their radio every Wednesday night. Kurt agreed to send postcards to their mothers to tell them that Muff and Mac were doing okay. His wife read letters from Muff's mother to Muff, telling her not to worry about her and to enjoy her adventure with Mac. On Palmyra, Buck Walker was safe from the authorities, but he didn't seem any more relaxed or happy. He had quite a temper and was being really rude to others on the island. Also, several times he snapped at Stephanie. She tried to be understanding, and although the food choices were slim, they weren't going to starve. They did have some supplies left, and they could always get coconuts, crabs, or fish. Then on August 13th, a new boat arrived on the island. The two men aboard this boat, the Taloa, were Thomas Wolfe, a 26-year-old chemical engineer, and Norman Sanders, a former geology professor at the University of California at Santa Barbara. Now, he was moving to Australia with his family. Sanders' wife and daughter sailed with him from San Diego to Hawaii, but his wife was miserable and seasick, and she refused to sail on any further. So the wife and the daughter flew to Sydney, and the former professor took on Wolf to help him sail the rest of the way back to Australia. You know, Sanders specialized in coastal geography, and Palmyra was really appealing to him. Wolf was bitten by Walker's pit bull once he arrived on the island. Welcome. <laughs> Stephanie asked him for some flour and sugar, and he gave it to her. Now, he could see that the dog was hungry as well as Stephanie and Walker. They just seemed pretty ill-prepared to live on Palmyra. Wolf would not have sailed anywhere on the Iowa. The rigging was rusted telephone cables. The boat was leaking while it was moored in the lagoon. The mast looked at as if it could easily snap which would leave them afloat to starve or die of dehydration in the open sea. Yeah, so this is serious shit. This is not something to be messing around with. This is life or death. Yeah, I mean, fortunately they have food there, but uh, it sounds like it would be suicide to take that boat out and go anywhere. Exactly. And that's what makes me think that at least Walker knew that they were going to steal a boat. Not sure about Stephanie, but she had to have figured it out at some point. And as time moved on, the Grahams, finding out more about Stearns and Walker's behavior and that of their dogs, became less and less accepting of them. The rejection of Walker and Stearns increased every day until the relationship between the two couples had deteriorated to the point where Tom Wolfe characterized it as almost total war. 
when he left on his boat on the 17th of August, headed for Australia. The sea wind had arrived in the Palmyra Lagoon on July 2, 1974, and a few hours later, Edwin and Marilyn Pollock had arrived. The Pollocks became good friends with the Grahams, and the two couples frequently met for dinner. The Pollocks' plan was to stay for the entire summer, but then they became really uncomfortable with Stephanie and Buck, and fearing for their own safety, the Pollocks cut short their stay, and they returned to Hawaii on July 16, 1974, so they'd only really been there a couple weeks. Before leaving, they even warned the Grahams about the young couple, and encouraged them to leave too. When the Pollocks left, Muff was crying and she wanted to leave with them, but Mac insisted that they were safe. He said he felt very secure, he had two guns, and he refused to take Pollock's advice. The Pollocks gave Stephanie a gift of flour and cooking oil, just to be magnanimous, but they felt that leaving the island was the wisest choice. They saw Stephanie, and even more so Walker, as dangerous, desperate, and very unpredictable. So they were disappointed that the Grams wouldn't leave. They actually were quite worried. Well, it sounds like there was reason to worry. Yes, it was very rightly so. Now, on August 17, 1974, Wolf and Sanders sailed away. Mac and Muff escorted them through the channel and stood on a big rock waving goodbye. Now, when they were gone, this left Muff and Mac alone on the island with Stephanie Stearns and Buck Walker. So after Wolf and Sanders left, Palmyra had two solid days of rain. Stephanie put out containers to catch the rainwater. She talked to the Grams about sailing to Fanning Island to buy supplies and sold Mac their generator for $50. I guess that's going to buy food. That's what they said. And he did want the generator. It was actually worth about 500 bucks, so it was a deal. Now Stephanie kept a diary, and she wrote in it about preparing the Iowa for the trip. What we don't know for sure is whether she and Walker planned to make this trip, or if it was all a ruse, and their plan to steal the sea wind and murder the Grams. Yeah, on September 4th, Kurt Shoemaker attempted his regular Wednesday night radio call with the Grams, and when they didn't respond, he was immediately very concerned. He knew Mac. He knew he was well organized. He hadn't missed a Wednesday night call before. It was possible that the sea wind was having trouble with the radio or the antenna, so Shoemaker decided he would try again the following Wednesday, because he knew Mac would be capable of fixing that if that was the issue. But because Shoemaker had been in regular contact with Mac Graham on his ham radio during that summer of 1974, he was aware of some things that were happening on the Wednesday evening of August 28th. This was the last time he spoke with Mac. He knew that the Grahams had invited Stephanie and Walker to a farewell dinner that evening because they said they were going to Fanning Island. He also knew that the Grahams believed they intended to depart Palmyra Island for Fanning Island on the Iola the next morning, which was Thursday, August 29, 1974. Mech shared his opinion in a letter that he wrote on July 30, 1974, to his big sister, Kit Graham. I'm not really upset at other people being on the island, but Muff is, he wrote. Roy and Jennifer are really not our type, but to dissect them would take a whole other letter. Then Muff expressed her opinion in a letter to her friends, the Jamesons, on August 1st, 1974. They are supposed to have some friends, two guys, coming down on a boat to bring them supplies, as they are nearly out of everything. Stephanie has been after the boats that come in for extra food, and it makes me mad they're mooching. They came down here to live off the land, so why don't they do it, and stop asking for things. In another letter written August 16, 1974, less than two weeks before her death, Muff wrote to her mother, I just wish that couple would leave with their damn dogs. They've attacked two people, and now I can't even walk around without carrying a big stick. So that gives us a pretty good insight into how things were going. Things were not going well. Now the following Wednesday, this is the week after... He first didn't hear from them, so we're, what, in September still. He tried to reach the Grams again. Again, there's no response. Shoemaker tried for over half an hour, never heard anything. Now he's getting more and more afraid that something had happened to them. Because even if Mac had a problem with his radio, he would have repaired it. 
he did have plenty of supplies and tools and skills. So Shoemaker's thoughts, of course, did go to Stephanie Stearns and Buck Walker, because he knew they had a boat that wasn't seaworthy and that they were out of food. His first thought was that maybe they had stolen the sea wind and left the Graham stranded there. So that Thursday morning, Shoemaker called the U.S. Coast Guard. But in the beginning, they just weren't helpful. Just because Shoemaker couldn't get a hold of them, that didn't mean they were in trouble or missing. They really needed something more concrete before they would act. So Shoemaker went ahead and called a friend of his, a pilot named Martin Vitusek. And he was a meteorological researcher at the University of Hawaii. He had visited Palmyra to conduct some weather experiments, so he was familiar with the islands in that region. Shoemaker asked him if he would do an aerial search of Palmyra, and he agreed. So the pilot flew over the wharf and over the area where the boats were usually moored. He flew over the area where the sea wind had been anchored. But the island was deserted, and there were no boats there. Yes, the shoemakers believing that something had happened to the Grams. They had planned to stay on Palmyra for up to a year. And if they had changed their minds, Mac would have notified Shoemaker. He called the Pollocks, who confirmed his fears that foul play was involved in their disappearance. They said that they had sensed trouble, and they tried to get the Grams to leave the island when they left. Still, he couldn't get the authorities to react. So Shoemaker turned to his ham radio friends for help. Many of them lived on boats, and the guy who ran the network, Robbie, sent out a call for help in locating the sea wind. Any possible sightings were radioed to him. So on October 28, 1974, a beautiful sailboat slid into Honolulu's Alawai Yacht Harbor. It was trimmed in a fresh coat of lavender paint, and it anchored away from the crowded boat docks. No name or home port was visible on the boat which anyone who knows boats would find pretty strange. Yeah, so the Coast Guard called the FBI office in Honolulu to report that this missing sailboat had been seen in the harbor. The sea wind had been reported missing over a month earlier, and Pollock recognized it. And, of course, this boat was registered to Mr. and Mrs. Malcolm Graham. But the owners weren't there. They weren't on board. And, of course, more ominously, this boat had been repainted like someone was trying to hide that it belonged to the Grams. Missing boats are usually a Coast Guard issue, but the Coast Guard was insistent that they believed the owners had met with foul play. So FBI Special Agent Kelvin Shishido agreed to go to the harbor. Once there, he met with a Coast Guard agent and with Edwin Pollock. So Edwin and his wife Marilyn had been members of this Hawaii Yacht Club for a really long time. They'd gone off for the afternoon and returned to see the sea wind there. It was repainted, but still very recognizable to them. They watched the sea wind, and they saw a man that the Pollocks recognized as Roy Allen pull away from that boat in a dinghy. Edwin Pollock told Shishido the whole story about his missing friends and the desperate young couple out on Palmyra. So the three men decided to take a closer look at that boat. Edwin Pollock pointed out blue spots beneath the fresh coat of lavender paint. A gilded figurehead was missing from the boat, and there was netting around the sides of the deck. Edwin explained that Stearns and Walker had used that same netting on the Iola to keep their dogs from falling overboard. So Edwin... He wants this couple arrested immediately, but Shishido agreed that when Roy returned, they would question him. Palmyra belongs to the United States, and since it was out of the jurisdiction of any state, the FBI had jurisdiction over any crimes on that island, and that would include boat theft or even murder. If the Grams had come back to Hawaii and then been killed, this would have been a case for the Hawaiian authorities. But as it was, it was the responsibility of the FBI. So the next day, people at the Yacht Club had learned that something was going on. And this was the largest, busiest harbor in Hawaii. Over 500 boats were there. Coast Guardsmen had interviewed several people there. And Edwin Pollock was up early, ready to help identify the boat. And the couple. The Coast Guard called Shishido at 8 a.m. to tell him that a lookout had seen a man and woman getting ready to leave the sea wind in their dinghy. Shishido was there within just a couple of minutes, 
and the woman dropped off the man at one of the docks and then headed back to the sailboat. The man on the dinghy saw the Coast Guard in the harbor, and he took off his clothes and dove into the water. So this, of course, was Buck, and the woman, Stephanie, was still on the dinghy, and she headed for shore. Edwin Pollock identified this woman as Stephanie Stearns. When she saw the Coast Guard boat heading toward her, she rode faster, and she reached the land before them. Then she made a run for it. She jumped onto a pile of rocks, then she waited a minute for her dog to catch up, picked up the dog, and took off with her dog in her arms. And she ran toward a nearby hotel. Buck Walker, also known as Roy Allen, swam under boats and docks and was heading towards the shore. About 20 minutes earlier, a man on a nearby boat had called out to Stephanie that the Coast Guard had been around the previous night asking questions about them. She had returned to the boat to tell Walker, and they left on the dinghy. Stephanie planned to go back for the dogs who were barking wildly on the deck, and they made a plan to meet up back at the beach restrooms. But when Walker saw the Coast Guard heading towards them, he swam off. Though on Stephanie's being chased, carrying her dog, she's being chased by Edwin Pollock and a Coast Guard lieutenant named Wallish. She was in the lobby of the hotel, kind of hiding behind a potted plant, <laughs> holding her little dog. So, and that's when she was apprehended. Stephanie smiled at them. She greeted Edwin by name. And she claimed that she wanted to tell him what had happened, but she first needed to use the restroom. But the lieutenant shook his head, told her she was going to do the ship with him immediately. He held her by the arm and led her out of the hotel. Yeah, the Coast Guard decided to tow the dinghy with their ship, and Edwin Pollock rode in the dinghy with Stephanie. And once they were moving, Pollock asked her if Mac and Muff were still alive. Stephanie's story to Edwin was that the Grahams had invited them to dinner. They were going fishing and told Stephanie and Walker to wait for them on the sea wind. After it got dark, she said, they turned on the masthead light and waited for the Grams to return. They never showed up, she said, so Stephanie and Walker went out to look for them. She claimed that they found the Sea Wind's motorized dinghy upside down in the water. And then they continued their search for days, she claimed, but there was no sign of the Grams. A few days later, they were going to sail on the Iola, but she got stuck on a reef. And when they couldn't free the Iola, she said, they decided to take the sea wind. But the way she presented it, it was an emergency. What else could they do? But, you know, Edwin Pollock was not buying this story. He said to Stephanie that he knew they wouldn't have tried to sail on the Iola. It just wasn't seaworthy. Stephanie and Edwin boarded the Coast Guard cutter together, and Agent Shishido and some Coast Guard investigators were waiting for them and they took her down to a compartment below deck to talk. And this time when questioned, Stephanie modified her story. According to her, on the last Friday in August 1974, she and Walker were preparing to leave Palmyra on the Iola. She was on the Iola when Walker returned and told her that the Grams had invited them for dinner on the sea wind. Then Walker left the Iola again to take a bath on shore. When he returned again, he told her that the Grams had told him they were going fishing for evening dinner, and if they were a little late, they should just make themselves at home on the sea wind. The dinner was to be at 6.30 p.m., and that's when Stephanie and Buck boarded the sea wind and waited. The Grams didn't return, she said, so they ended up sleeping on the sea wind overnight. She said the next morning she and Walker searched the area, and they found the Grams' dinghy overturned in the shark-infested lagoon. They continued to search, she said, until September 11th, and then finally decided it was hopeless. And they didn't know how to use Max radio, so they couldn't call for help, she said. Stephanie said that they rationalized that the Grams would have wanted them to have the sea wind. So they tied a 50-foot rope to the Iola and tried to tow it back to Honolulu with the sea wind. But according to Stephanie, the Iola hit a reef and was stuck. So they ended up leaving it behind. That's her story. That's her second story, yes. Well, we already know that when the pilot flew over the island, there was no boats to be seen. Right. So that doesn't help her story. Stephanie said that they arrived at Kauai on October 12th. They stayed there overnight and then sailed to Pokai Bay, Oahu, on the 15th. And they stayed there for a week. The ship was dry docked from the 22nd to the 28th. 
That's where the sea wind was painted. Then they sailed to the Alawai Yacht Club that afternoon. They had found $400 on the sea wind. Now they knew that the boat didn't belong to them, but they loved it so much that they thought the Grams would want them to enjoy it. So they didn't report the disappearances of the couple because they didn't want to lose the boat. Well, that's one part of her story, I believe. Yeah, that they didn't want to lose the boat. Right, right. But Edwin Pollock didn't believe it. He was actually disgusted. He knew that Mac and Muff would never tell anyone to make themselves at home on the sea wind when they weren't on board. So there's no way they would have made that offer to Stephanie and Walker, who they didn't even like. Pollock was incredulous to hear Stephanie claim that the Iola had gotten hung up on a reef as it was being towed by the sea wind. It contradicted what she told him, and he was certain that she was a murderer at this point. So the media heard the story, and they filmed Stephanie as she was being led into the FBI office in handcuffs. She was booked in the Honolulu jail on charges for stealing the $400 and the boat. But Buck Walker eluded the police, and Shishido had to work to get any leads on Roy Allen and bring him in. Shishido went to the DEA because he suspected that maybe drugs had been involved in this crime, and he showed an agent Roy Allen's driver's license. The DEA agent recognized the photo immediately on the ID as belonging to Buck Walker, and Buck was wanted on his drug conviction from back when he was a no-show for his sentencing. On November 1st, two days after Stephanie had been arrested, a search team entered the Palmyra Lagoon on a tugboat. At a campfire site, they found some pieces of cloth and burned sunglasses. In Roy Allen's camp, they found a cot and some sketches of sailboat designs. There were also some books and magazines left behind. On the roof of an old building, they found a garden of foot-high marijuana plants. So good, he was able to cultivate some. It did grow, yeah. Two guardsmen with scuba gear began to search the water of the lagoon. One stood by with a rifle for the sharks, but the sharks were too aggressive and the dive had to be stopped. Yeah, but there was no evidence found that the Grams were still on the island, and no other boats were there either. They also found no evidence of a murder or foul play. The Grams were just missing. Mac's older sister, Kit, had flown to Honolulu the day after Stephanie was arrested. She'd last seen Mac and Muff six months earlier, and she knew they were planning a lengthy voyage so she had flown down to spend some time with them. Mac had been super excited then about the adventure, but Muff had confided to Kit that she was nervous and really didn't want to go. In fact, just months before they set sail, Muff had been arrested for drunk driving. She'd never been a heavy drinker, but Kit believed she'd been self-medicating because she was so anxious about this trip. So that tells you something. It sure does. So Kit decided that she really wanted to talk to Stephanie Stearns. She was really desperate for any information about her brother and his wife, and Stephanie was the only one who could really tell them what had happened. So they meet with Stephanie in the Honolulu jail, uh, and she was kind of friendly. Stephanie quickly brought up the sharks in the lagoon, and she proposed that the sharks may have eaten the missing couple. So it was hard for Kit to envision this friendly young woman murdering Mac and Muff. But Stephanie was evasive and pretty skilled at manipulating people. So after going over the whole story of Stephanie, Kit was more confused than when she had arrived. For one thing, the Graham's dinghy, the Zodiac, had been designed by Jacques Cousteau and was known to be one of the most stable dinghies in the world. Kit had never heard of one being flipped or capsized. Also, if Mac and Muff had actually disappeared, why didn't Stephanie report it when she got to Hawaii? Well, sure. By November 8th, Buck Walker had been on the run for 10 days. No one noticed him when he came ashore at the harbor. He'd come up after dark, and he had some cash stashed in his bathing suit. So he walked to a clothing store and bought a Hawaiian shirt, some shorts, a hat, and some sunglasses. So he looked like the other tourists, and he was able to walk to a friend's apartment to get some sleep that night. On November 9th, Walker took a bus to the airport. He bought a plane ticket in the name J. Evans and boarded the plane for Hilo. In Hilo, he walked to a hotel one mile from the airport. He went to see his old friend Gina Allen that next day. She and her boyfriend had broken up, so Walker spent the night with her. And the next morning, she gave him camping equipment, food, clothing, and toiletries. 
Then she drove him 30 miles away and left him in the Kohala Mountains. So he did have a way with the women, or, you know, at least some women. Yeah, and after about a week camping in the mountain range, Walker went to a small town on the north side of the Big Island. He checked into a cheap motel and ate lunch in the cafe. The FBI arrested him at the cafe for boat theft and a fugitive warrant for failure to appear. So were they just lucky or somebody tipped him off that he was there? Somebody tipped him off, I believe. He was wanted. Yeah, he certainly was. In mid-December, Buck Walker was in court to be sentenced on the drug charge. His attorney announced that he was willing to take a polygraph regarding the Graham's disappearance. Of course, it wouldn't be admissible in court, but he said it could be useful in helping him to reach a plea bargain. And Stephanie, too, agreed to take the test. In late December, prosecutors and the FBI's polygraph expert put together a list of questions they wanted to ask both Walker and Stearns. The list was submitted to their defense attorneys, and then Buck Walker withdrew his offer to take the test. Yeah, those questions are too tough. I'm not taking that. Yeah. So neither defendant was given the polygraph, but we don't know if Stephanie backed out or if the prosecution just changed their minds and didn't bother giving her the test once Walker backed out. But in January of 1975, one week before the joint trial of Stearns and Walker was to begin, a motion was granted by Stephanie's defense attorney to try her separately, and Walker was given a five-year sentence for the old drug charge. Uh, In March, Mac's sister Kit received a letter from Buck Walker. The postmark was from March 11, 1975, but the letter had October Hawaii written in the upper right corner. So in this letter, Buck was all sympathy as he notified her of the terrible accident that had killed Mac and Muff. He told Kit that he had admired Mac for his self-sufficiency and that the couple had been friendly with him. He mentioned the planned trip to Fanning for supplies, and he said that Mac and Muff had invited them for a bon voyage dinner. Before signing off, he offered their deepest sympathy. Yeah, but Kit didn't believe any of this. She didn't even believe that it had been written back in October. She called the FBI and told them about it, calling it a bunch of lies, and they agreed with her. So Stephanie went to trial in June of 1975. The charges against her were for the theft of the sea wind its contents, and the $400 cash. Although investigators were confident that Mac and Muff had been murdered, they didn't charge her with murder at this point. They were hopeful that some more evidence, or some human remains even, might be found. And you know, there's no statute of limitations for murder. So they could bide their time while she was in jail on the other charges. Sure. Same with Buck. He's in jail. Exactly, yep. So they... So they they have have some time. The luxury of some time to investigate further. Yes. So the investigators had made that decision that murder charges could wait and they'd continue to work the case. Four witnesses who were on Palmyra when the Grams were there testified. And two issues were recurring. Stephanie Stearns and Buck Walker were desperate for food. And the Iola was not seaworthy. Edwin Pollock also testified about Stephanie trying to escape from the police when she was in the harbor that day. Another witness, who lived with her husband on their sailboat in Poke Bay, testified about meeting Stephanie and Buck back in October of 1974. She said she visited with Stephanie on the sea wind, and she saw a framed photo of the Grams while she was there. Stephanie told her that the owners got sick of the upkeep and sold the boat to her and to Walker. Stephanie asked this woman to pick up some photos for her at the drugstore that she needed to get developed. Now remember when that was a thing. Some of the youngins might not remember that, but you took pictures and you had to take your film in to get it developed before you'd even see what your photos were like. So by the time the woman got around to mailing these prints to Stephanie, the news was out about the grams being missing. So this woman took the prints to the authorities and didn't send them to Stephanie. So there were pictures of the Iola with its hatch cover off next to the sea wind, and Palmyra could be seen in the background. 
So these photos definitely contradicted Stephanie's story that the Iola had gotten caught on a reef and it had been left behind. The Iola had made it out of the channel and out to the open sea. Now the fact that the hatch cover was off showed that Stephanie and Buck meant to sink the Iola at sea. No other conclusion. Well, no, without the hatch cover, it would definitely fill with water and sink. It would. The defense objected to the introduction of these photographs. They argued that the foundation was insufficient to establish the time and place that the photographs were made. But a photograph with the sea wind in the foreground authenticated the other four pictures as to what time they were taken. It was apparent that in all five photos, the cloud and the sky conditions were identical, the lighting was the same, the distance between the camera and the Iola was the same, and also the color condition of the ocean was identical. So the five prints were obtained from the developer at the same time, too. So there was sufficient authentication to admit these photographs as evidence. Yeah, Ken White, who's an expert on sailboats, testified that he examined the sea winds dinghy, and he concluded that there was no evidence it had been submerged in salt water. He also said that the dinghy was the most stable watercraft available. Now, he tested the stability of the dinghy by putting four men in it, taking it out into the water and trying to capsize it. They could only get a small amount of water into the boat with four grown men bouncing on one side of it. So that's pretty stable. It's pretty stable. Grown men, yeah. Stephanie was the only person who testified in her defense, and she stuck to the story she had told the FBI. On cross, the prosecution showed her the photos of the Iola and the Sea Wind sailing together in the ocean off of Palmyra. So she lied, denying what was really just clear in the photos. She was quickly found guilty of the theft, and she was sentenced to two years in prison and five years probation. Buck Walker was in jail, and he followed Stephanie's trial in the newspapers. He went to trial in December, and he testified in his own defense. He also denied taking the Iola and the Sea Wind out to sea. He was found guilty, and he was sentenced to 10 years, which wouldn't begin until after he finished his five-year sentence on the drug charge. But still, you know, no one knew what had happened to Mac and Muff Graham, except Stephanie and Buck. And that's extremely frustrating for the people who love them. Uh, Wouldn't you want to know what happened? I mean, you have an idea, but... You do, but you want to know for sure. Absolutely. We'll, we'll go forward a few years to November of 1980, and we have a sailing couple, Sharon and Robert Jordan, arriving on Palmyra, and they were the only ones there. So they're happy to be alone. In January of 81, Sharon was walking on the beach, and she found a human skull. And then other pieces of a human skeleton were scattered on the sand nearby. There was an aluminum container nearby, and a lid next to it was some wire. From the position of the bones, Sharon could deduce that they had fallen out of a container. Inside of the lid was one small bone and a wristwatch. This was a woman's watch. There was also a piece of cloth there, and she noticed some burn marks on the inside of the box. Yeah, so they knew that this wasn't on the beach earlier. It had been washed in. So clearly, these remains, which belonged to Muff, were in that container and sealed with the wire. So it would be confirmed later that these remains belonged to Muff Graham. Sharon had picked up the skull to make sure it didn't get washed back to sea. And she also saw some charred marks on the skull and a small round hole in one of the temple areas. So it seemed that Muff had been shot to death and set on fire inside of this box. Sharon and her husband had found a sunken rescue boat off the coast of the island, and it had compartments with containers that were identical to the container on the beach. And two containers were missing from this sunken ship. So it was likely that the remains of Matt Graham would be in that other missing container, although it wasn't found. So the Jordans notified the Coast Guard, and they in turn relayed the news to the FBI. On February 4, 1981, a team of investigators was sent to Palmyra to pick up Muff's remains and search for more evidence. Returning to Hawaii six days later, the remains of Muff were examined and verified as her remains. Then three days later, a federal grand jury indicted 
Buck Walker and Stephanie Stearns for first-degree murder and the death of Muff Graham. They were tried separately. Yeah, so Buck Walker's defense attorney filed several pretrial motions. Motions for a separate trial, as well as a change of venue, were granted. On May 28, 1985, the trial of Buck Walker finally began in San Francisco. This time, Walker chose not to testify on his own behalf. The closing arguments were presented on June 11, 1985, and after just one hour and a half of deliberation, the jury returned with the guilty verdict. Walker was sentenced to life in prison, and this sentence would run consecutively to the prior sentences he had received for his past crimes. So he's pretty much finished. He's in jail. You would think. Stephanie's defense attorney, Vincent Bugliosi, observed the murder trial of Walker. He noted the prosecutor's presentation, and he predicted the same thing for Stephanie. In his book, titled And the Sea Will Tell, Bugliosi wrote about how Stephanie agreed to a polygraph, and he believed in her innocence. On February 3, 1986, nine months after Buck Walker's trial, the murder trial of Stephanie Stearns began. And about a week into her trial, defense attorney Bugliosi filed a motion to dismiss the felony murder count, leaving a charge of first-degree murder. With the felony murder charge dismissed, getting a conviction was going to be more difficult. Well, right, because the felony murder charge would mean she didn't really have to be physically involved in it, right? Right, yeah. yeah. And this Bugliosi just seemed like he really believed what she was saying. He seemed kind of taken with her. When I read the book, that was my impression. So Douglas Uberlaker, forensic anthropologist, testified on his conclusions regarding the skeletal remains that belonged to Muff Graham. During the trial, he held up Muff's skull and he studied it. In response to a question from the prosecutor about a whitish area on the top part of the skull, he described the area as calcination. He testified that the calcination would have come from some sort of heat source that could generate extreme temperatures. So that's interesting. Yeah, this whitish area was found on the upper left part of the skull that extended from the eye area over the left top of the skull and back down to about the center of the posterior of the skull. So the prosecutor's theory was that Muff had been tortured with max acetylene torch. Well, that's an awful thought, and I hope that's not the case. Oh, God. That's just horrible. Uber Laker explained that the irregular margins of the calcination indicated that at the time of the burning of the skull of Muff, there was tissue and moisture protecting that area of the scalp, where the intense heat was not directly applied. His opinion was that the application of this kind of damage to the bone would require intense heat, somewhat above 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And he also believed the burning occurred at or near the time of death. Well, let's just hope it was after she died, because that's a horrible, horrible thought. Yeah, well, I'm not sure what they would torture her for. What information did they think she had? Oh, I don't think it would be for information, but I'm just thinking that Buck Walker was a bit of a psycho. Okay, so and he, like he's doing it for fun? Maybe. Yeah. And we don't know about Stephanie either. We don't know what kind of person she was. She could certainly manipulate and lie quite well. But anyway, I would certainly hope that Muff was dead before that horrible stuff happened. A forensic odontologist examined the skull and the lower detached jawbone of Muff, and he concluded that the jawbone was fractured by blunt trauma. So here's more evidence that she suffered, and that this trauma had detached the jawbone from the skull. And he found some other evidence of blunt trauma. There were fractures to the upper left molar, of Muff's skull and a lower right molar in the jawbone. And there were also some fracture lines in the lower jaw. He testified that the fractures most probably occurred either at or near the time of death or hopefully post-mortem. He said that the injuries to the teeth would cause intolerable pain and that the fracture of the jawbone would cause death if it was left untreated. Then in response to a question from the prosecutor about the degree of force, necessary to cause these fractures? He said he was of the opinion 
that to split the jawbone from the skull and fracture the roots of Muff's teeth would require extreme force, characteristic of using a sledgehammer, a ball-peen hammer, or some other really heavy round object. So in other words, her killers beat in her face with a hammer or a similar object. So the question for the jury at this point was, did Stephanie participate in this? You ask different people, you'll get different opinions. I think after reading two books on the topic, I believe she did participate. And of course, this brings horrible images to mind. If Walker was the killer and Stephanie was unaware of the murders, was it possible that Stephanie was fooled by Walker into thinking the Grahams died by accident? If so, she'd have to be really stupid to believe him, and I just don't buy it. But still, in the end, Stephanie Stearns was acquitted. Although most everyone seems to have agreed that Buck Walker was guilty of murdering the Grahams, the public opinion at the time concerning Stephanie's involvement in the murders was really mixed. In fact, the two books we read about this crime, And the Sea Will Tell, by her defense attorney, and Final Argument, by Tom Busey, have these opposing views on Stephanie. Bugliosi, her defense attorney, believed that she was innocent, while Tom Busey believes the trial was just a disaster and she should have been found guilty. Busey believes that the prosecution did an inadequate job and that Stephanie Stearns got away with murder. He makes a case in his book for the murders being planned before the Grahams even arrived at Palmyra. He believed that Stearns and Walker planned to steal a boat and kill a crew, and they never had any intention of trying to sail the Iola back to Hawaii or even anywhere else. And I certainly believe that Walker made that plan. When Stephanie heard about it or how involved she was is unknown, but I just really can't believe she had no idea. It would be tough. It would be. To buy that. Well, yeah, if she wasn't involved, we have to believe that she didn't hear anything during these murders. It is possible there were really noisy birds on the island, and the rustling of the coconut trees could cover gunshots. The Iola was tied up on the other side of a piece of land where the Grams had anchored the sea wind. So if Stephanie was aboard the Iola, as she said she was, she might not have been able to see what was going on or hear anything. If she was as busy as she claimed to be that day getting the Iola ready to sail to Fanning Island, it's possible that she was unaware of what was going on. Yeah, but then you have the other side of the story, and that is that a lot of what Stephanie did showed a consciousness of guilt. Oh, absolutely. As soon as she and Buck got on board the sea wind, the first thing they did was help themselves to the Graham's food and alcohol. She was photographed also wearing one of Muff's blouses. Mac's sister, Kit, recognized it. Yeah, so they really made themselves at home on that boat. Right. They had so no it's int- not like they were worried that their hosts weren't there. Exactly. Stephanie also lied about the sinking of the Iola until she was confronted with the photo that showed both the Iola and the sea wind outside of the channel in the western lagoon of Palmyra. Also, Stephanie was really quite aware of Buck's violent and antisocial tendencies. He was selfish, lazy and didn't even care if his dogs were starving and attacking people. She also had to know that he envied the Graham's boat and provisions. He probably really resented Mac for being successful and able to do things he couldn't do. But maybe the most damning act showing consciousness of guilt was how Stephanie sailed back to Hawaii on the sea wind, and they had it repainted. They did not report the Graham's missing and had no intention of doing so. And, of course, they had no intention of returning that boat. Yeah, her stories just don't ring true. Stephanie didn't seem very afraid of Buck at any point. And in a lot of ways, she was the leader of the pair. She was certainly the smarter one, and she was the one who interacted more with the other people on the island. Yeah, I mean, Buck was sociopathic. So Stephanie was either a sociopath too, or she just had really horrible taste in men, which it has to go farther than that. Yes, it does. I mean, she had accepted that he was a fugitive and had no problem evading the authorities with him. So this makes me think that she would have helped him with anything, including murder. And if she didn't, she almost certainly had to know that the Grams had not died in a boating accident. That was preposterous. 
Mac was extremely competent on the water, and the dinghy was nearly impossible to capsize, as the prosecutor was able to prove. Walker served 22 years in prison. He was released in 2007 at age 69. He was given early release, and in part because he was in poor health. In fact, he died of a stroke in 2010. He published a book about the case where he wrote that he had been seduced by Muff Graham and Mac had caught them having sex. That he, just seems like he, the lowest of the low to say that. It doesn't. Jesus. He claimed that Mac shot his wife and attempted to shoot him. Mac's body has not been found. Uh, so it certainly seems like we're re-victimizing the victims. Absolutely. I mean, nobody believes that Muff would have had anything to do with him. She was really disgusted by him. Yeah, I, I don't think that that story holds water. No, I mean, it's really a slap in the face, a stab in the back. It's just a horrible thing to say, really, for the people who, the family, the people who love this couple. It's a really shitty thing to do, to write that. Yes, and I would agree with you that they were both equally culpable. Really? I don't know if I think they were equally culpable. They certainly were. You think so? Yeah. I mean, I think that she had to know, at least after the fact, what had happened. It's just, I don't think we could really prove that she participated in it. But certainly, she should have been found guilty of the felony murder. And that's where Tom Busey wrote in his book, The Final Argument, that the prosecutor really messed up with that. Yeah, why'd they take that off? Yeah, they, that shouldn't have been allowed. I guess it was actually the judge's fault for doing that. I'm not sure what the prosecutor argued there, but it seems like a mistake either way. So for sources, we have those two books and The Sea Will Tell in Final Argument. There's an episode of the ID show Dark Waters, which covers this case. It is season one, episode three, and it's titled Cursed Paradise. There's also another small documentary on this from a show called The FBI Files, and that one is titled Deadly Paradise. So fascinating story. It certainly is. I started reading the so-called book that Buck had written, and I, I just... Oh, you did? Yeah. How was it? Oh, it was just such shit. That <laughs> I, I read about 10 pages, and I said, forget it. Well, it was all just to defend himself, right? Yeah. Poorly written, poorly conceived, and it's just... No, I, I couldn't read it. You're complete rubbish. Complete. Well, it's just like that letter that he supposedly had written back around the time of their deaths to Mac's sister, where he's saying how sorry they were and how close they were. It's just a lot of bullshit, really. Yeah, it is. So TCB's music was written and produced by Tristan Capel, and I think we have some feedback today. We do. I got a voicemail and a couple emails. So the voicemail is from Sarah, and she has a case suggestion. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Sarah from St. Louis. I had written you an email maybe about two years ago with a case suggestion for Amina and Sarah Saeed. They were killed by their uh, father in a so-called honor killing. The father was on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. And I was just calling because it looks like he's been caught. So uh, it looks like he was caught a few weeks ago in Texas. So that uh, I thought that was really good news that I just thought I'd share and um, maybe suggest again that you cover their case and maybe perhaps maybe a broader topic on honor killings in general. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. We have done one episode on an honor killing. It was where they'd actually hired people to do it, I believe, or an uncle. So. Yeah, it, well, it was. It was an uncle in the family who felt that she had besmirched the family. But this is a father killing his own two daughters. Right. And I think we had mentioned that in the episode of the Jassy honor killing. But now he's, he's been found. So it, it might be something we should take a look into, although I'd, I'd want to see what happens in his trial. I think that would make it more interesting if we could find out what happens and have some closure to it, sure. So I think we should add it to our possible to-do list. I'll put it in the queue. Okay. And we have a case suggestion from Daisy Lou 2020. And she writes, My suggestion is about a young woman from Italy, Texas, Shelley Nance, an art student who had moved to Dallas to attend an art school. She would later become friends with fellow student Nathan Shuck, 
who had a roommate, Daniel William, a 28-year-old former Navy cook, who, unbeknownst to Shuck, had fallen in love with him. William would become very jealous of Shuck and Nance's friendship, and would unfortunately plot and kill her as she slept in her bed, stabbing her over 40 times. He also tried to frame Shuck for the murder by planting evidence inside his room. So that sounds really interesting. I was looking at that and thinking that's a really interesting case to look at. Yeah, I thought so. And I like this kind of lover's triangle with a twist. Sure. I think it'd be interesting to, to look at. Great. Well, thank you, Daisy Lou 2020 That must be a YouTube suggestion with that kind of a name. Yeah, I don't remember. Okay. So we have one more case suggestion from Kate, and I'm going to let you read that one, Dick. Well, this is from Kate. Hi there, Jill and Dick. I love to listen to your podcast and really enjoy the husband and wife banter that you inject among your research. Being an Aussie, I also love you that you've covered so many of our true crime mysteries in your material. Have you considered doing a show on the angels of Winarka and Belangio, Carly Pierce Stevenson and Candelise Pierce? This mother and daughter had their lives tragically ended in separate locations and were only reunited in death due to DNA results. Well, that's all very mysterious. It is. So this mother and daughter were last seen by family members in 2008. Then in 2010, Carly's remains were found in Belangio Forest in New South Wales. And five years later, 1,100 kilometers from where her mother's remains have been found, the daughter's remains were found in Winarka. So DNA testing established the relationship. Pierce Stevenson's former partner was charged and convicted of the two murders. Huh. So we don't know what the motive was there? No, I have to get looking at that. It's a pretty famous case in Australia. Well, I really do enjoy the Australian crimes. The Australians have the best nicknames for things. <laughs> yeah, don't they? They really do, yeah. It's a great language that they speak. It's English, but it's different, and I thoroughly enjoy it. So thanks, Kate. We will definitely look into that. We certainly will. It sounds like an interesting case. Absolutely. We had, I don't know, two or three years ago, someone else mentioned it, and I can't remember right now, but uh, take a look. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate it. And if you have a few minutes, we would love it if you could leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen. And until next time, we'll see you at the quiet end. Yeah, we still have some of that beer left. It's really actually very good. Not normally my type of beer, but I'm enjoying it. Feeling pretty relaxed now. You are. Let's go take a nap. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.